go to uh, Proverbs chapter 30 tonight. I can't believe we're almost done with the book of Proverbs. We must have been looking at it a long time. Ezra was playing, I'm not sure what week it was, but uh, I was listening to that and I thought, you know, we've heard a lot of good things. <laughs> and I don't mean because I'm preaching it, but uh, you, know, you go through the book of Proverbs, there's more than you can ever get, but uh, man, we've looked at a lot of things. And uh, you know, don't, don't let the availability of it make you devalue it. You know, just because God's Word is available, uh, don't think it's not important. Uh, there's things here that will really help you. <laughs> Real wisdom. Uh, not like Woman's Day or <laughs> you know, all these silly magazines and, and things. Uh, this is real wisdom. This is God's wisdom. We had looked in chapter 28 at conscience and confidence. Uh, verse 1, I, I thought was I really uh, hit it in a nutshell. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Uh, we, we need to have our conscience right before God and man. God can give us confidence. Then in chapter 29, we looked mainly at correction. Verse 1, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Uh, every one of us are going to be corrected in our life, and we need to respond in a, in a godly way. Then in, in chapter 30, let me read the first six verses to start tonight. The um, commentators debate over who this man is. and <laughs> um, Personally, I don't care. <laughs> this is God's word, <laughs> whoever he was. Um, so here we go, verse 1. The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy. The man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ukel. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind into his, in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We'll just stop reading there. As, as I was reading that this week, I thought, you know, I've felt like verses 2 and 3. Have you? Have you ever felt like that? Man, I'm just a worthless hunk of junk, you know? <laughs> and uh, this guy is not trying to impress us, you know, when he's writing. He's not, you know, saying all the great things he's done. Uh, and, you know, really, when, when you think about your relationship to the Lord, it's not based on your natural ability. It's not based on your knowledge or wisdom or how great you are. It's based on the Lord. And our, our relationship with Him, the mistake we make is we overvalue our part and we undervalue His part. And he starts off with a really a right attitude. You know, you're not going to learn anything from me, but here's what God has to say. And uh, verse 4 is very much like Job. If you've ever read Job where he gets to the end and God says to them, uh, I've written it down here, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> uh, you know, our wisdom is not really that at all. We've got to go to the Lord uh, for wisdom. And just stop and ask yourself, you know, really, how do we know the Lord? Well, we know Him by His Word. And that's what He gets right to in verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. See, His reference was, you know, verses 2 and 3, I'm, I'm a brute. <laughs> I've got nothing to offer. But here's God's reference. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God's Word is perfect. His Word is, when it talks about it being pure, it has to do with being refined. You know, all the imperfections are, there's none of those, they're gone. And His Word is sufficient. That's an important thing for us to understand about the Bible. You know, a lot of people try to add to it. God says, don't, don't add to it. You'll be found a liar. And there's lots of, well, there's quite a few people have written books uh, you know, to add to the Bible. And they, got their, they have their explanations, but uh, they're not right. God's Word is sufficient. It's, it's all we need. Uh, another verse that we often look to on this is Psalm 
12, verses 6 and 7. You know, we, we believe we have God's Word. When we, uh, when we read our Bible, you know, we don't feel like we have to look for some hidden meanings or lost books or uh, you know, add to it. Uh, Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, we believe in the inspiration of Scripture, but we also believe in the preservation of Scripture. Uh, God has given us His Word, and, and we still have it. And what a wonderful thing that is. Then he, he goes on in, in verse 7. There's some really interesting things in, in this chapter. I've got to be honest with you. I don't understand them all, but we'll cover them, and uh, we'll see what we can get here. Verse 7 through 9, he says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So he says two things that he wants. Now, like anything else, people argue over what the two things are in there. <laughs> uh, probably poverty and, and riches, where he says, keep me from being so poor that I you know, have trouble and blame you, and uh, keep me from being so rich that I, I don't feel like I, I need you. In verse 8, he says, feed me with food convenient for me. Now, the, he's not asking for convenience for himself. He's basically saying, it's like when somebody asks if they can do something for you and you say, oh, well, just, just whenever it's easiest for you. That's what he's saying to God. You know, God, just give me what's convenient for you. Give me what you know is best for me. And let me tell you, that's a pretty good way to go. <laughs> Usually God will give you a lot better than you'd ever <laughs> ask for. The other, the other side of these verses is, uh, I, I think he's asking God to keep him from, from sin keep him from vanity and lies, and also to keep him from extremes, you know, poverty and, and riches. But uh, the, the link then to the next section is, is verse 10, when he says, Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. You know, we love it when people apply wisdom to us, <coughs> but we need to also apply it to others. And, uh, you know, as he goes there... You know, from every word of God is pure, and here's what I need from, from God. Uh, we need to be careful that we use wisdom when it comes to others as well. And, and then he goes in verses 11 through 14. I got to thinking about this. You know how we have all these different generations? Generation X and Generation Y. I think this might have been Generation B. Generation bad. <laughs> uh, read it with me. You, you'll see what I mean. Verse 11. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. That was not a nice generation. <laughs> um, yeah, he talks about quite a few different things there. They were selfish. They were unrealistic. They, they thought they were great. I've told you many times, when I ask people, you know, if they died, would they go to heaven? The universal answer is, yeah, I think I would. I've been pretty good. <laughs> Maybe we're that same generation. I don't know. Uh, very unrealistic. Um, proud. Unkind. And this is the kind of thing we need to apply to ourselves. You know, we can say, oh, yeah, everybody out there, they're, they're bad, you know. But uh, the point is we need to apply it to ourselves. And we don't want to be like that. You know, we don't want to be a, a generation or a person who's selfish or not acknowledging our sin, but seeing sin in others. You know, as a kid, you used to say, you know, if you point one finger at me, you're pointing four back at yourself. <laughs> well, it's true. Uh, we need to apply these, these things to ourselves. Uh, then he, he gets into some lists. Uh, this is what I was saying. I, I don't understand all of these, but I know that there's some, some great things we can learn from them. We probably won't learn them all tonight, but we'll look, we'll look at them quickly. The first are four, I call them insatiables. I'm not sure that that's an actual word, but uh, verses 15 and 16, he says, the horse leech hath two daughters, crying, give, give. 
I always used to, when I used to read this, I always used to think a horse leech was a person, a kind of, like something that somebody did. <laughs> it's actually just a leech, a big leech. Um, the horse, a leech, big leech, horse leech, hath two daughters crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not it is enough. He, he, for some reason, talks about four things that are just never satisfied. And you think about a leech, a leech never gives. A leech just sucks, you know. That's, that's the way they are. That's the illustration he's giving here. Uh, you know, the grave is never, never full, never satisfied. Uh, barren womb, uh, drought. We've experienced that, some of, some of us. Fire. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, why he's, he's saying this. But then the link, I believe, is verse 17. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother... The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Now, this links us to the, to the next list. And, and I think, in a sense, rebellion is insatiable. You know, if you're a rebel, there's never going to be enough rebellion. But it has its consequences. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot in society now where people are just so rebellious. And, and then they're upset when somebody arrests them or, you know, whatever the, the consequences are. And he goes on from the four insatiables to the four wonderfuls, verses 18 and 19. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Four wonderful things, he says. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I, I've never looked at a snake and thought, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he had a different experience than, than I did. Um, I've, seen, I've looked at an eagle in the air and thought, wow, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And, and he's talking as well about courting, the way of a man with a maid. You know, uh, uh, Some of us are probably too old to remember, but uh, you, you know those, those days when you were just so embarrassed? I, I can remember wanting to ask a girl to go to something, and oh, man, it was, it was a major effort, you know? <laughs> And, uh, oh, you know, you took all week working your way up to it. And, uh, I think that's what he's talking about. You know, it's just, it's just a beautiful thing to see. And uh, yet the next, very next verse, uh, verse 20, such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I've done no wickedness. Uh, something that should be wonderful can become pretty disgusting. Uh, Self-deception is one of the worst things in the world. And, you know, there's plenty of people like, like verse 20 where they're just living ungodly, uh, dirty lives. Uh, if you ever go door knocking, you, you, see, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, just openly disgusting lives. And it's just, we're all right. <laughs> yeah, it's just normal uh, to, to some people. God wants it to be wonderful. But for many people, because they ignore his wisdom and, and ignore him, it's, it's not. And that leads us to four troublesomes. Verse 21, for three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he's filled with meat, for an odious woman when she's married, and an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Like I said, I, I don't understand all of these, but when he uses the word there in verse 21, disquieted, I looked that up, and it's used in some places for an earthquake. <laughs> if you've ever been in an earthquake, it's really disquieting. Uh, one of the worst things about an earthquake is not just the initial shock, it's that then there's a whole bunch of others. And you keep thinking, oh, is, is this the big one? <laughs> and it just is very disquieting. And he said, these are, these are things that just make life unhappy, un unsecure, insecure maybe is the word. Uh, a servant that reigns, a fool who's full. A hateful wife. And then the last one, in a sense, is a displaced wife. You know, when the family is, is out of joint. Um, very troublesome things. And, and we see this all, all the time in society. Then he goes on to four wise things. Verse 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. 
The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Uh, so four little, little things. Uh, I looked up that thing of a coney. And uh, it, if you've ever read commentaries, you know, if you read three commentaries, you'll get three different opinions. <laughs> um, some, think, some think it's a badger. I don't think that fits at all, because a badger is not a, a frail animal at all. Some people think it's a rabbit. But somebody mentioned a, an animal. I don't even know what it is. It's a hyrax. Hyrax. It's kind of like a rabbit, but, uh, but not. That, that, that is what I, I think it is. Not that anybody cares. But uh, he just says there's, there's four wise things. They're, they're not strong in themselves, and yet they're amazing. Yeah, it's just incredible to see how God has made these animals to do things, to you know, make the burrows and, uh, for the ants. And I was thinking the other day, spraying ants, you know, and I was thinking, this is useless. <laughs> There's a million more where this came from. They don't care. You know, they keep coming. They, they're very, uh, very persistent. Um, four wise things. And then he talks about four pleasing things. Again, these are things that I haven't always looked at and thought, that's a pleasing thing. Verse 29 there be three, three things which go well, yea, four are comely, or, or good, good to look at in going. A lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. A greyhound, and he goat also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. So four things he lists that are, are pleasing to, to see. And I can see that, you know, a lion, greyhound, even a billy goat, if you've ever, ever been around a you know, the big horns, and boy, they're, they're the king, you know. And uh, uh, then he mentions a human, a strong king, you know, a king that's doing a good job and uh, people are, are appreciative of. So all these lists, go home and figure them out. <laughs> um, but he, he comes to the conclusion in verses 32 and 33. I, I think it's the conclusion. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil... Lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. I think these verses relate back to the introduction. Uh, if you follow self, you know, like he talked about at the beginning, you know, I'm just a brute, I don't know any, anything worthwhile. If that's how you order your life, um, or are you going to be like verse 32, uh, following pride and foolishness and, and evil? But if you'll follow the Lord, God can help you. And he gives us all these different lists to consider, you know, the good and the bad and how he's worked in nature and how he's worked in man and, and so on. And, uh, you know, if you're living like verse 32, following, he talks about lifting up thyself, pride, uh, thought evil, you know, foolishness and evil. Um, well, the solution to that is stop. <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> um, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. And it, then he talks in verse 33 about dealing with anger. And he, it, it sounds kind of strange the way he puts it, but he's talking about pressure. Pressure has results. You put continual pressure back and forth on milk, you'll get butter. You put pressure on your nose, you'll get blood. <laughs> And he's saying, if, if you put pressure on yourself, you'll get anger. There's plenty of things you could be angry about if you really wanted to. And if you push it, you will be. And pretty soon you'll get used to being angry whenever things happen. You'll think it's your right to be angry. Uh, in, anyway, he's just saying, uh, you don't have to live like a, a brute. You don't have to live like an ignorant person. Man, God's given us more than we'll ever take in in one lifetime. Uh, we can be learning. We can be wise. God can help us. Um, let me give you a couple of verses in conclusion, particularly about anger. What to do with anger. Psalm 37, verse 8. We just look at four, three or four verses here. Psalm 37, verse 8. Some of God's instructions are very plain and very practical. Psalm 37, 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now, the reason God would tell us that is because it's possible. God would not say that if that was impossible. You know, you'll hear people all the time, they'll say, he made me mad. Oh, I had to do it. He made me mad. 
and they'll just take away any personal responsibility and, and blame it on someone else. But anger is a choice. Anger is a choice. And what we do with anger is a choice. He, he tells us to cease or to forsake it. It's interesting, the whole portion there, verse 7, he says, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently. Verse 9, uh, evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So he's saying rest in the Lord, not in the situation of the person. Two other portions. James 1, verses 19 and 20. You probably know this, this verse. You'll think you do when, when you hear it. James 1, verses 19 and 20. Just a, a brief comment that he makes there about anger. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That's an important statement right there. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You know, we like to think, oftentimes, that we have righteous indignation. And that is possible. Be angry and sin not. The Bible does say that. But the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, we need to, to not, um, we need to understand anger's real work. It's not the righteousness of God. Uh, verse 21, he says, uh, this is one of my favorite statements in Scripture, just for the way it sounds. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only. Uh, we can lay, lay apart these things. We can set them aside, and we can receive with meekness the, the engrafted word. Uh, so don't give place... Uh, to the devil is, is what he's saying. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of myself in my notes here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, that's where it says that. Ephesians chapter 4, last verse. Ephesians 4, verse 26, he, this is where he says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Now, don't give the devil a place. Uh, deal with your anger. If, if you're angry, well, deal with it that day. Don't go to bed with it. Uh, take care of it. Uh, don't give place to the devil. Then verse uh, 32 and 33, Ephesians 4, 32, let all, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there, if you can find verse 33, you're a better man than I am. Uh, yeah. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I think what he's saying there is instead of those first, replace it with the, the second. You know, instead of being angry, uh, be kind, and, and so on. Replace it. In this chapter, he talks several times about putting off and putting on. And he's just saying, put off, get, you know, get rid of that bitterness and anger and so on, and, and put on the kindness and uh, forgiveness and, and tender heart. God can, can help us to do that. And, you know, we, we really aren't much. You know, before God, we're just brutes. <laughs> you know, what is man that thou art mindful of him, God says. But God has wisdom, and God can work in, in our hearts and lives. Uh, like I said, there, there's some real insights, I think, there in Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, patterns in people, patterns in nature, uh, Patterns in God's, God's Word. And I'll just close by reading uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Now, what a blessing that is. Any comments or questions before we take some prayer requests tonight? I hope that you'll continue to read the book of Proverbs and, and let it speak to your hearts. It'll, it'll be a blessing to you and, and help you. Um, are any of you memorizing the verses that we gave out? We gave out 26 verses, one for each letter of the alphabet. We should be to... Uh, the, the only one that's not in Proverbs is the last one, Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, Z, and repent. <laughs> All right, well, work on them. <laughs> if you don't like those, memorize a different one. Uh, looking back, I was, I was thinking we should have memorized just one from each chapter, and then we could have worked on it all together. Next time, we'll do that. 
All right, well, let's take some prayer requests tonight. Uh, do be praying, you know, like we've, we have for, for June, uh, for their family, uh, for Peter, even though he was here.